Good morning. Thank you for attending my talk. So um, for many people, uh, quantum computing is a very theoretical. So um, this talk, um, the goal of this talk is to go deeper into the, the practical um, uh, perspectives of quantum computing. So we'll talk about different topics, the, the basics, of course. Then we'll talk about the quantum computing simulators, if you want to experiment by yourself. And now um, we are lucky enough to have a free uh, quantum computing cloud services. So you, you will be able to do your own uh, quantum computing uh, computations uh, on the cloud. And uh, we will um, talk about different um, topics uh, around cryptography, how to reverse uh, cryptographic primitives. Uh, there are basically two ways to do that. And uh, we'll see examples uh, about uh, CRC-8 and uh, AES, right? And then we'll finish with the post-quantum cryptography to see what are the solutions uh, for the future. But first, uh, let me introduce myself. So I'm René Schitz, uh, coming from Paris, uh, France. Uh, I'm a security expert working uh, at Digital Security, which is a subsidiary of the Econocom Group. Uh, my main interests are uh, mostly security of protocols and number theory. That includes cryptography, of course. But let's start first with the basics of quantum computing. So I'm pretty sure you know uh, a few basics. So this is to remember you the basics. So first, uh, small scale uh, objects like uh, atoms, molecules, photon, electron, and so on. Both behave as particles and waves huh? uh, during experiments. Uh, it depends the way you measure them. If you measure like them like particles, if you want to have a position, for example, they will behave as a particle. If you want to um, measure a frequency or if you want uh, to measure uh, a power, they will behave as a wave. So it depends how you measure them, actually. Right. Another uh, interesting topic about quantum computing and quantum physics in general is uh, the main characteristic of these objects uh, are not defined when they are created. Uh, everybody, everybody thinks a particle has a position and a speed. It's not the case until you measure them actually. Uh, when you uh, create a particle, uh, when the particle is created first, it has no position and no speed. It's when you will measure it that they will, it will get, the, those uh, figures will get defined uh, upon measurements, right? So uh, what we, we say uh, actually is that they have a, a, a probabilistic uh, uh, position and a probabilistic speed, for example, or a probabilistic frequency. And once you measure them, this probabilistic uh, function will collapse into a single value and their actual position and speed will get defined at this point. So this is the third point. So uh, consequently, it's not possible to measure uh, some um, um, physical properties of a particle and then copy them into another one. It's not possible. It's the no cloning theorem and you can actually prove it because it's a theorem. And uh, strangely, you can uh, take these properties into account and define a way uh, to do powerful computations. Even if this uh, seems constraints, uh, you can use these constraints to do a lot of powerful computations. So how does it work? Uh, in uh, traditional computing, you use bits huh, as information. Uh, in quantum computing, you will use qubits, that is to say particles that can uh, be uh, one or zero, like bits, but that, that can be also um, a, a combination huh, of zero and one, a superposition of zero and one, because the particles can behave like zero and one once uh, they, get, uh, they get measured. So when they get measured, they will uh, have a fixed value but before, they will behave like they, uh, are, uh, they are at the same time zero and one. So when you will do computation 
huh? with that kind of qubits, they will uh, take all their possible values, so you will have all the possible results at the same time uh, at the end of the computation. So that's very powerful, of course, because uh, when you have a growing number of qubits, you have a huge um, uh, field of results that gets computed at the same time, virtually. The difficulty is, will be to uh, focus on the result and find the, the interesting results in all the possibilities, right? So in a mathematical point of view, a qubit is a vector of two values. Huh? Uh, for example, uh, the uh, qubit ket0 is uh, 1, 0, and the qubit 1 is 0, 1. And they form a basis. Uh, from a mathematical point of view. That is to say, uh, every qubit is a linear combination of 0 and 1 with different probabilities. Uh, it can be 100% 0, 100% 1, or a combination of both. Uh, that is to say 50-50 or 20-80 and so on. Uh, there are ways to combine uh, qubits to form uh, what is called qubit registers. Uh, using a tensor product, so that's very uh, mathematical, so don't uh, be afraid of that. It's not a major point. But the easiest way to visualize a qubit is to take a sphere, what is called a block sphere, huh? and say the zero qubit is um, like a neuro in a unit sphere, huh? that points to uh, the top, and the one uh, qubit is in a row that points to the bottom of the sphere. Uh, that is to say they are opposites on a sphere. And on a sphere, you can rotate the vector on basically every uh, axis. That is to say you can rotate the vector over the x axis, over the y axis, or over the z axis. And quantum computing is actually exactly this, uh, uh, only rotations around the three axes. So once you visualize this, you are able to do any kind of quantum computation huh, just by rotating the vector around the three axes, right? What's interesting uh, in uh, quantum computing is that for thermodynamic reason, hmm, uh, a quantum gate, what is a quantum gate? It's like a gate in, in a traditional computing, that is to say a hand gate or OR gate or XOR gate uh, in traditional computing, you can have exactly the same thing with uh, quantum gates, uh, but they are a bit different uh, because uh, quantum gates must be reversible. Why? Because uh, when you uh, compute in a given environment, your environment is, is very fragile. Uh, you cannot have any kind of um, modification from the external environment, external environment. So your environment should be completely closed, completely isolated from the outside. So you can have any kind of energy going in or going out your environment. So for thermodynamic reason, you cannot have any energy that is consumed or that is fueled outside. So that way, your system does not uh, consume any kind of power during computation. So the computation is completely rever reversible. So for example, in uh, traditional com uh, computing, you have the AND gate. The AND gate, you have two, uh, two inputs and one output. Huh? But of course, this is not reversible, because from the output, you cannot guess the previous two inputs. In quantum computing, you will be able to do that because every, basically every uh, single uh, quantum gate is reversible because of thermodynamic reason. Huh? You cannot have any kind of um, of energy coming in or out from your environment, so it's completely reversible. So every gate that is reversible will be a quantum gate, basically. Okay. So let's see. A few examples, it will be more easy for you uh, to understand. The easiest quantum gate is the poly 
X gate, that is to say a gate rotating the qubit around the X axis. And have the, we have seen if you rotate the, the zero vector around the X axis, you get the one vector, the one qubit vector. If you rotate it um, in, um, in the opposite uh, way, so this will be a rotation around the X axis and the gate who does the rotation is the poly X gate. That is to say it's similar to the not gate huh? in traditional computing. Uh, you get the opposite qubit. You, when you input zero, you get one. When you get, when you input one, you get zero. Huh? It's uh, completely similar to the not gate. And it has uh, a, a matrix, you see, that is the, 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 the normal matrix rotated. Huh? Uh, at uh, 80, 80 degrees, uh, 90 degrees, sorry. And if you apply two times uh, the poly X gate, of course, uh, you come at the initial point, so it's, it gets cancelled and you have the identity gate, which does nothing, right? Another interesting gate is the Adamar gate. The Adamar gate actually uh, transforms any fixed qubit for example, the cat zero or cat one qubit into a superposition, an equal superposition of zero and one. So this gate will be fundamental and will be very important uh, because it's basically the gate you will find at every uh, input circuit when you are doing a quantum computing uh, circuits. Huh? Uh, because this gate uh, will uh, uh, will uh, enable you to uh, do. Uh, parallel computation over all the possible input values of your circuits, right? So it transforms a fixed qubit like 0 and 1 um, to a, a superposition of 0 and 1 with exactly the same probability. So you get half of the time 0, half of the time 1. And you can use it uh, to, tr to initialize your inputs to do parallel computation on a set of qubits. Another useful uh, quantum gate, because we have seen quantum gates with only one input and one output, so this time the C0 gate will be uh, very useful because it's the simplest gate with two inputs and two outputs. And basically it's a uh, if not gate, okay? That is to say it has two inputs, the control gates and the uh, sorry, the control qubits and the target qubits. And um, it basically tests if the control qubit is true. And if the control qubit is true, it will uh, negate the target, the target qubit, right? So basically it, it makes uh, if the input is true, then negates uh, the target qubits. And if the input is false, do nothing, right? So the symbol is that one, a small uh, plane circle and a large empty circle, right? And it tests if the, f the first qubit is one, and if the first qubit is one, it will negate, uh, apply the, the poly X gate to the second qubit. It's the C0 gate. And when you have uh, multiple C0 gates, that is to say, a C0 gate with many control qubits and only one uh, target qubit that is called Toffoli gates. Huh? And Toffoli gates are universal. With Toffoli gates, you can basically program any kind of traditional gates, huh? like AND, OR, XOR, uh, make additions, make tests, and so on. A simple uh, gate also is the swap gates that only swaps two qubits, so that's very easy to understand. And when you have um, sufficiently enough gates, you can have a, a, a universal set of gates, that is to say you will be uh, able to combine them to give you any kind of circuit you want, huh? any kind of circuit that does arithmetic operation, that does uh, algorithm, that does everything, okay? So Toffoli gates only uh, 
is a universal uh, set of gates. If you have only have the fully gates, you can manage to do everything uh, in um, traditional algorithms uh, and any kind of uh, function, right? But uh, generally, it's easier, sorry, to have uh, a set with Adamar gates, phase shift gates that makes a rotation of the, the phase, that is to say the Z axis, and controller node gates. So that's the case on basically every quantum chips available now. So we will use three or four different gates to um, manage to have any kind of circuits. Um, anyway, um, there are some uh, difficulties with quantum computing huh? because you cannot copy a register into another. Huh? That's the no-cloning theorem. Or um, better said, you cannot uh, copy them in an independent way. Huh? When you copy a, a register into another register, they will get linked. Huh? Uh, and um, they are magically linked, right? You cannot uh, have an independent copy, like in a program when you set uh, A equals B, where you, sim you simply copy the value of B into A. So that's not uh, very possible in the, the, the quantum world, right? Of course, you don't have uh, uh, that many qubits in uh, quantum shifts because um, they are expensive and because you, you need to protect them from the outer environments, and it's quite complicated to have many, many independent uh, qubits protected from the environments. So usually, uh, you compute with only uh, a few dozen qubits, uh, not more. Huh? So that's the current records nowadays. And uh, you can have um, errors, of course, if your environment is not completely prote uh, protected, okay? You can have um, some f false measurements, okay? Some errors in your computation. So you better use uh, error correcting codes huh? in order to ensure uh, your results will be good. What, uh, how many qubits do you need for serious purposes? Uh, it's estimated by uh, the, the, the biggest, like uh, IBM or uh, Google, that you need 50 um, qubits only huh, to have uh, a, a sufficiently, sufficiently powerful computer, that is to say, a quantum chip that is able uh, to um, to um, be more powerful than the, the, the computers we have, the traditional desktop computers we have. Only uh, 50 qubits will be enough because you will be able uh, to, to do uh, many, many kind of computation and uh, many, many kind of results uh, explored at the same time. That's basically 2 to the, uh, eight, uh, to the 50 power. Huh? Uh, that's, that's 10 to the uh, eight, uh, 10 to the 15 or 16 uh, possibilities at the same time, only if you have uh, 50 qubits. That's, that, that limit is called the quantum supremacy, huh? because when you will reach this limit, huh, uh, we will definitely prove that the, um, the quantum uh, chip is uh, more powerful than the traditional chip, right? And of course, you need uh, uh, quantum gates and qubits with a good fidelity, that is to say, a few errors when you measure them. Huh? Uh, currently, the error uh, rate is about 1%, so you have 1% uh, uh, chance that you have an error during uh, a gate or during a measure. Huh? That's pretty good, but not enough for a serious computation, because when you have uh, multiple gates that are chained, uh, and if you have only 1% uh, error rate, but when you, you chain more than 40 or 50 gates, you will have 50 percent chance that you, are, uh, you have an error in your computation. Huh? For, so for serious uh, algorithm, you will have uh, an error rate uh, that is quite important. So one, uh, one percent error rate is not enough really to do uh, serious things. 
Uh, so, uh, to, um, the most important thing to remember is uh, the number of qubits is not the, the most important uh, factor, right? The most important criterion. The most important criterion, in my opinion, is the qubit fidelity. Huh? That is to say, if we have a good fidelity rate, we will be able to have a deep uh, circuits, that is to say, uh, interesting algorithm to run on. Uh, it's not a matter of number of qubits, actually. So let's have a look at the different quantum computing simulators you can find. All of them are free, so you just have to create an account and you can play with them. So the, f the first one is Quantum Inspire. Quantum Inspire is uh, quite a simple one, okay? You can either uh, drop your gates on uh, a partition, like this, and experiment, or enter the gates in a, an assembly listing, an assembly uh, source uh, code, uh, where you uh, apply successively uh, the gates, like the N gate, the CNOT gate, the PolyX gate, like an assembly program. So either the, uh, as a source or as a circuit, as a graphical circuit. Another one is Quirk uh, from the algasr.com uh, website. Quirk is uh, one of the most advanced because you can find all the ar arithmetic operations like the addition, the multiplication, the division, even the exponentiation. So you, you have uh, high level primitives uh, in arithmetic, so you can do a lot of things. And the, the author has been um, um, employed by uh, Google because of the success of the his tool, quite interesting tool. Then the author is working as Google now. And if you want to uh, play on the go uh, in the subway, uh, on the train, and so on, you can you, ha you can have a, a small simulator on your Android phone. That is to uh, to say a quantum circuit simulator, which is called QCS. Uh, you can design and simulate any kind of simple circuits with a smartphone and have the different probabilities, the different measurements you see here. So for example, let me show you, um, yeah, with, with Quirk, yeah, Quirk here, right. You see here, right. So this is Quirk. You have the input qubit here, so two input qubits. Let's apply another mark gate to the first qubit. So, um, as I remember, the other mark gates will uh, make the first qubit a superposition of ket zero and ket one. Huh? So equal probabilities um, of zero and one for uh, the measurements, right? And if we apply a C not gate after the Adamar gate, right? Remember uh, the C not gate is when uh, the first qubit is true, then negates the second qubit, right? What happens? So if you simulate with your brain the circuit, so the Adamar, you will have half a probability to get zero and one. So let's assume it's zero. If you have zero here, the C not gate will do nothing, okay? Because the first qubit is false. So we, you will have zero and zero. Let's assume the Adamar gate gives you one. Then the uh, C not gate will negate the second qubit. So you will have one and one. Okay, so either zero and zero, either one and one. Okay? And this is exactly what is uh, said here. Huh? You have 50 percent chance that you have zero, zero, zero percent chance that you have zero and one. 0% chance you have 1 and 0, and 50% chance you have 1 and 1. So you can see here, both qubits will have the same value, even if we don't know the value in advance. Okay? Now, uh, let's negate one of the qubits with a uh, poly X gate, right, at the end. And you see now, you will have 0, 1 or 1, 0 half the time, 
Okay? And that's interesting because um, that was a big problem for Einstein. Huh? Um, Einstein uh, called that kind of circuits, which is called the EPR, the uh, paradox. He called that a spooky action at distance because if you have two different particles that uh, exit from these quantum circuits and you put them very far away one from the other, for example, at the opposite of the universe, right? They both behave at the, at the, uh, at the output of the circuits as particle and wave, so they both have the zero and one value. But when you measure one, you will instantly fix the value of the other because they have opposite value. So when you measure zero, you will be sure that the other at the opposite side of the universe will be one, and conversely. And Einstein was uh, very worried about that and called that spooky action at distance. Huh? But you cannot use that uh, for uh, communication because you cannot choose the value zero on one. Huh? It's just a matter of probability, and you cannot transmit any bit of information like this. Right? If you want to experiment with more simulators, you have a very uh, exhaustive list on uh, Quantiki Wiki. So you can have a look at this, that one. But that's more funny to experiment on real quantum computing hardware. Huh? And now we are lucky enough to have nearly uh, five quantum computing public services. All of them are free. Yeah? You just have to subscribe but you can uh, use them uh, completely freely. One of the first I demonstrated four years ago was the, the Bristol University Quantum in the Cloud, which is a photonic quantum circuit with only uh, two or three qubits, so that's quite limited, but that's, in, that's one of the first, and that was interesting to, to trace, to test, and to experiment with. Now we have much better one, and the Chinese uh, have launched a service uh, around the, the brand uh, Alibaba uh, that gives you uh, up to 11 qubits. IBM, uh, which is one of the, the, the well-known uh, uh, players uh, in the area, uh, gives you uh, up to 14 qubits for free. And if you uh, are a paid uh, customer, you can have 20 qubits. Rigetti, which is a competitor, gives you uh, up to uh, 19 qubits and even more than 100 qubits if you are a paid customer. And um, the last one is D-Wave. So you probably know D-Wave, but D-Wave uh, is a bit different huh? because uh, D-Wave is another uh, quantum architecture. Huh? You cannot do directly, you cannot implement directly quantum gates, but you uh, will be able to uh, create a circuit that will um, mostly do uh, optimization problem that gives you what is the, the, bet, the worst value of a function, huh? the higher value of a function or the lower value of a function over a, a wide range. So basically it's for uh, optimization problem, numerical optimization problem. That is to say, uh, for example, if you want to uh, uh, enhance your uh, finance portfolio, huh? you will be able to do uh, that kind of numerical optimization using D-Wave. And d waves uh, um, claims that it has uh, 8,000 uh, qubit chips, but remember that is not a, a, a universal um, quantum computer, huh? but just a network that do uh, problem optimization, right? And it had been proven recently that um, both kind of architectures are equivalent, that is to say, uh, you can make the, the same circuit using a universal computer or an adiabatic computer, huh? but you will need much more uh, qubits in an adiabatic computer because it's less efficient for general purpose computation. Now let's talk about cryptography because it's a uh, very interesting um, area for quantum computing. Huh? We hear a lot of things uh, in the media about breaking cryptography with quantum computing. So what's the uh, actual situation? 
Let's see first uh, how do we implement basic uh, PBOX operations, that is to say basic permutations. Huh? PBOX is a permutation, is a, a basic brick for many uh, symmetric algorithms, right? So how do you model uh, permutations using a quantum computing, using a quantum computer, sorry? Um, basically, if you have a complex permutation, first you have to decompose uh, the complex permutation in single permutations, that is to say, in two qubit permutation, huh? because basically you can uh, decompose any kind of complex permutation in single permutation, in a composition of single permutation of two elements. Huh? Then it's easy when you have a uh, permutation with only two elements that to uh, get, um, uh, to, to apply them a swap gates. Huh? Swap gates is just a permutation of two elements at the, the same time. So you replace all the, the permutation of two elements with swap gates. But the swap gates is not a gate that exists for real in a quantum uh, architecture. So you have to uh, you have to choose uh, gates that are uh, implemented in hardware for real on, on quantum uh, architectures, and one of the, the the most basic gates that will help us is the C naught gate. Remember, and basically you can replace any swap gates here with three C naught gates that are opposites like this. With only three C naught gates, you get a swap gate. So you can implement basically any kind of complex permutation with only C naught gates quite easily. And you can even uh, simplify the, the whole circuit at the end because if you have um, opposite C naught gates, they get cancelled at the end, so you have a much more simpler circuit. Right? So it's quite easy to model any kind of permutation. And um, it's kind of magic because every single gate, remember, can be reversed huh? uh, because of a thermodynamic reason, right? So if you want to uh, do the inverse um, permutation, you just have to execute the circuit from the end to the beginning, and you will have the inverse permutation very easily. So there is no need uh, to... Um, to think about the circuit and do the same for the reverse circuit. You just have to execute the circuit the opposite way, and you get the opposite permutation. So that's very, very simple with quantum computing, because uh, basically you have um, only reversible computation. right? So that's the first way. Uh, to reverse a, crim a, cr a cryptographic primitive, you implement the direct function, the direct operation, and you just read the gates in the reverse order to apply the, uh, the reverse function on a, a given uh, result. Huh? But unfortunately, uh, not every function is reversible, right? So it's not that easy all, all time. And sometimes you want to reverse uh, complex functions that are not completely reversible. And the other solution uh, will be to use an oracle. An oracle is a black box saying yes or no, uh, depending on uh, if the result is interesting for you, to select good values among a lot of different values, uh, find the, the, the values you are interested in. So that's basically the two different approaches to reverse uh, any kind of cryptographic primitive. The easiest uh, oracle that exists is the Grover oracle. Huh? The Grover oracle, uh, you just have to implement the, function, the normal function, and then to implement a black box saying yes or no, is it interesting for me? Huh? Is this value uh, the good value among the other? If you combine your function with the Grover Oracle, you will be able to find the right value very efficiently. For example, if you have uh, 10 business cards in your pocket, how many uh, searches do you have to, to do in average to find the correct one? Tell me. Five, yeah. That's half the number of business cards you have in your pocket because you have basically uh, 
50% chance to find uh, the right business card when you have uh, reached half of your business card. So the complexity to find one business card among 10 business cards is five, five operation on average. That is to say it's a, a N complexity huh? because uh, it will depend on the number of business cards you have. But basically, you have the same amount of operation than the, the, the amount of business card you have in your pockets. So that's not very efficient. Grover Oracle does a lot better huh? because Grover Oracle will do the same huh? among unsorted business cards with only the square root of the number of business cards you have. Huh? So if you uh, implement an oracle saying if the name of the business card is uh, Lifshitz, for example, if you have my business card in your pocket, you will find it in only the square root of 10 searches. Huh? That is to say, basically, three searches huh? uh, and not five. And uh, the optimization will be better if you have a lot of business cards, for example, for uh, 100 business cards, you will find it in only 10, uh, 10 tries, huh? and 50 if you have to uh, classically find uh, among all the, the business cards, right? So Grover Oracle is very efficient if you have to find a value over many, uh, only uh, with a square root of n and not complexity of n. So as an example, I have modeled uh, a simple function you probably know, which is CRC8. So CRC8 is not a cryptographic function, but is a hash function that's not that easy to reverse without studying the, the mathematical properties. CRC8 or CRC16 uh, is used, for example, uh, in the zip archives to tell you that it's not corrupted or corrupted during uh, the, the storage or the download of the file. Huh? It's used in integrity uh, purposes. So if you use, um, uh, sorry, if you uh, model um, the CRC8 function very uh, uh, naively, you will, for example, find this solution, right, which uh, use only CNOT gate, but you have a lot of them. Right, 9, 12, 15, 18, 21, 24. With 24 CNOT gates, you can model the CRC8 function. But the problem is you have temporary qubits here. You need 8 qubits for the input, and you have 8 qubits in the output. But the problem is that you will use 8 temporary qubits, so you need twice the amount of qubits of the function and you will not be able to reverse the function because you don't know the value of the temporary qubits at the end. If you want to find the input, you need to have all the qubits as the output, and you don't know the value of the temporary qubits in the output to reverse the full circuit. So that works, but only in the normal side, not in the reverse side, because of the temporary that qubits that are called ancillary qubits. Uh, and it's a, it's a problem here to reverse the function. So in order to have something better, I've used the RefKit framework. Ref, RefKit framework is a useful framework to do reversible computation. And with this framework, you are able to input a true stable huh, with input and output. And this framework we, will find you the optimal, if it can, uh, optimal circuit to do a given reversible computation. And uh, we are lucky, the CRC8 function is a reversible computation. So with uh, a few minutes of computation, you can get this circuit as a, an assembly uh, listing that uh, is optimal. Huh? You cannot have less instruction to do the same things. It's completely optimal. And it's also optimal because it uses uh, no temporary qubits, no ancillary qubits, so you only use eight qubits to do computation on uh, input of eight qubits and have results over eight qubits, right? It's completely optimal. Here is the, the same circuit, uh, but much more uh, uh, in, a, in a graphic uh, fashion, right? 
So the idea is to uh, here set the outputs of the CRCI circuit. You have the reverse CRCI circuit, and at the end you will get the input value of the CRCI function. That is to say, you have reversed the CRCI function using uh, quantum computing. And what's interesting is uh, you haven't studied any um, arithmetical property of CRC8. Huh? It's a generic way to invert function. You don't have to study uh, the mathematical properties of functions. It's a very general way to invert the function. So uh, this is with uh, Quantum Inspire. And if you do the simulation here, here my output, my output is zero. Here it's one, zero, one, zero, 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 zero. I do the reverse CRC8 circuit. So at the end, I will have the, the input of CRC8 get, that gives you as the output zero, one, zero, one, zero, 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 zero. And when you uh, simulate the circuit, you will have 100% of time the good solution, which is one zero zero one 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 zero. Well, that works. Now, if you use uh, not a simulation but a real run on a quantum chip, you will have a bit of noise huh, here. So sometimes you will find bad solutions, but most of the time, like ninety percent, ninety-two percent of the time, you will find the good, the, the, the good solution, right? So uh, when you do quantum computation, uh, it's useful to do many tries huh, to uh, uh, keep uh, the, 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 the solution that uh, is, uh, is here most of the time huh, to uh, cancel the noise, right? For example, on IBM quantum chips, the number of tries by default is 1,000, huh, so you you get the circuit executed many, many times, and you, f you find the, 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 ma the, the major, the first, you, get, you keep the, the, the first results, uh, and, and you cancel the other. Here's the full uh, program to uh, run uh, the function on uh, IBM quantum chips, huh? IBM Q experience, on real quantum hardware, so you need uh, the IBM Q14 Melbourne quantum chips, which has 14 qubits, Right, so you have the full program here. You you have to send to the to the batch queue of the quantum chip uh, the program, and when you when it gets executed, you you query the results, and you have this kind of results. So you have the different uh, tries huh, with the number of counts, and you uh, see the uh, good results among the first uh, top results. And you see, there are bad solutions. For example, 0000, zero, zero, zero is the solution uh, with the highest number of counts, 95. But it's not the solution. It's a solution with the lowest energy, huh? 0000. zero, zero, zero. Uh, so uh, it's the first one, but it's not the good one. Okay? So you have a few uh, mistakes, a few errors, because of uh, the, the decurrence of the, the quantum uh, computation. Right? What, what's interesting is if when you put this kind of circuit in a simulator here, so this is the reverse CRC8 circuit, you can uh, set as the output a superposition of outputs and find what are the inputs for that superposition. For example, here, it's 0 and 1 at the same time on the first qubits. Here, it's 0 and 1 at the same time, and here also. So basically, you have set eight different values at the output, and you ask for the different possible inputs, right? And you see here uh, something that is very interesting here. So it's 50, 50, 50, 50, so it's not interesting. But here, you will see that this qubit is always zero. Huh? So you will have the reverse computation of eight uh, different circuits at the same time and see this qubit will be zero all the time. This qubit will be zero all the time. Right? So you can find interesting properties of function like this. We can do the very same than the, the, the P-Box uh, modeling with 
the S-box modeling, right? For example, if you take the S-box function of AES, which is a bit more complex, but this is a basic uh, substitution, right? And I have found a good substitution with quantum gates. So it's very small because the, uh, the quantum circuit is quite complex. Huh? It's not only uh, 14 uh, gates here. It's 281 uh, poly-X gates, c not and Toffoli gates, right? Uh, it's not optimal, probably, huh? uh, because it, the, the circuit is not simple. So this is the simplest circuit for the S-box Uh, of uh, AES, but it's probably not optimal, but this is one of the best I've found. Uh, I have tested all circuits up to, up to 14 gates, so the, the optimal circuit must have at least uh, 14 gates. And it's a good, um, a good thing that uh, there is no simple optimal circuit, otherwise uh, AES will be broken, okay? You can do the very same with XOR encryption, okay? Uh, to break XOR encryption, um, you have to reverse the XOR encryption. So it's very easy to uh, reverse the XOR because it's its own uh, inverse. But you, you can use an oracle to test the uh, higher bits of the results to see if they are uh, printable characters. Printable characters in the ASCII tables will have all their upper bits set to zero. Huh? So this will give you a strong condition to reverse a XOR function using a Grover Oracle. Left uh, as an exercise for you, <laughs> if you want. So what are the threats against uh, actual uh, and current uh, cryptography? The main threats for symmetric cryptography will be Grover algorithm, as we have seen, uh, which is... Uh, a square root of n uh, complexity. So a uh, Grover um, algorithm will be able to divide by two any kind of symmetric algorithm, divide the key size by two. So for example, if you use AES 128, huh, it will give you a symmetric encryption with a strength, with an actual strength of 64 uh, bits, which is broken because 64 is the um, uh, current uh, record. Huh? for a broken symmetric encryption. So Grover algorithm will divide by two any kind uh, of algorithm, any kind of key size uh, for symmetric algorithms, right? So the solution is to double all the key size. If you have a symmetric encryption, if you use a symmetric encryption, you just have to double the key size and you will be uh, safe because uh, we can prove that Grover algorithm is optimal and there is no um, stronger uh, algorithm that will, that will uh, find the key uh, faster. So we can prove that is optimal. So if it's optimal, you just have to double all your key size and you're safe. Uh, it's not that easy with uh, asymmetric encryption because with asymmetric encryption, there exists a much stronger algorithm, which is polynomial th this time, not in square root but polynomial, that is to say that grows only with the number of digits of n and not with n directly. And it's able uh, to uh, break any kind of asymmetric encryption use, uh, in polynomial time, and it's called uh, the Shor algorithm. And it breaks basically uh, RSA, DSA, ECDSA, uh, ECDLP, uh, basically any kind of uh, asymmetric encryption we use uh, nowadays Uh, for web browsing, for certificates, for uh, SSH connection, and so on. And it uses uh, a quantum Fourier transform algorithm, but which is similar to the Fourier uh, transform you, you use when you do a signal analysis. Huh? So uh, there is no easy way to protect against this kind of threats. Uh, the best way to protect is to use post-quantum cryptography, huh, which is a very new field. And post-quantum cryptography uh, is the, the kind of uh, encryption you can use to uh, protect, again, quantum computing. So if you have a look at the, the website Qubit Counter, you can find the, uh, the, um, the current number of qubits, the, the current record huh, we have. So now it's 128 qubits for uh, the Rigetti quantum chips, but you can have a look to... Uh, track the, the change and the effort in the quantum computing uh, race. 
And if we graph the number of qubits over time, uh, it look it looked like some, a Moore law, exactly like in traditional computing, because uh, the number of qubits is doubling uh, uh, every uh, year or every uh, 18 months. And you see, uh, it's growing very fast. Huh? So uh, the threat uh, is coming. To avoid these threats, there are basically six different kind of uh, um, uh, algorithms that are supposed to uh, be uh, strong enough not to be threatened by uh, quantum computing. So six different approaches, lattice-based cryptography, multivariate cryptography, edge-based, code-based, super singular elliptic curve isogeny, and of course, the symmetric encryption is strong enough to uh, resist to quantum, uh, crypt uh, to quantum computing if you double all the key size. Huh? So you have six different families of cryptography you can use instead of the uh, actual um, of the current, sorry, um, uh, asymmetric encryption. And you have a, a conference that is called uh, PQ Crypto if you are interested in these topics. And it's the 10th edition this year, uh, and I think it will uh, be in China. And you can follow their Twitter feed to be uh, informed. They don't have a, a, a fixed website. But it's a, a very, um, uh, very strong area of research at, at the current time, right? There are very few uh, post-quantum uh, cryptography algorithms. Huh? The, the most well-known uh, for the moment is NTRU. It's a lattice-based uh, cryptography uh, algorithm. And you can use, for example, NTRU encrypt if you want to have uh, asymmetric encryption, and NTRU sign for digital signature. Right. So thank you for your attention. Um, we can take one or two questions in the remaining time. Any question? No answer questions? Everything was so clear. <laughs> uh, hello, I have a question. Uh, as we, we all know that uh, CRC8 is a kind of uh, Hashi functions. So what do you mean by using quantum computer to break? Can you, can the, you speak a little bit louder? Uh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I mean that uh, the CRC8 is a kind of Hashi functions. So what do you mean by breaking the CRC8 using con computer, quantum computers? Yeah. Uh, for CRC8, it's breaking is basically reversing, finding uh, uh, an input on on a given uh, output. Uh, the input uh, can be very long, not uh, just uh, one byte, right? I'm sorry, I, I don't hear you. Can you speak louder? It's noisy yeah. in the background. I mean, okay. Yeah. I mean, you uh, have a very long input, uh, right. and uh, I can use the CRC8 to get a one better uh, result. Here is the, the basic uh, CRC8 function, that is to say that takes one byte as an input and gives you one byte at the output. So that's, that's the simplest one, but you, CRC8 can be extended yeah. to take uh, much larger inputs, yeah? But uh, here, the, the demo uh, is only with one single byte because of the, the current uh, capacity of quantum chips. Okay, I see. It's just uh, a demo that works for the actual quantum chips, but uh, we don't have enough power now to, to have much larger input. Okay. Only uh, you can simulate it, but you cannot run it on actual hardware. Uh, another question about the D-Wave. We know the D-Wave is quite different from the security implementation of quantum computers. So what do you, what does the uh, number of computer, number of qubit in the D-Wave mean, meaning? Is it like the qubit numbers in the security implementations? Uh, sorry, uh, I think uh, I haven't heard the, the whole question. <laughs> yeah, we, we say that if, if it's a, a security implementation of quantum computers, there is a number of qubit we, we, we use this number to 
uh, to show how how strong this computer is. But in D-Wave, it's quite different from the security implementations. And it said that it have uh, 1,000 uh, quantum qubits. So is it uh, uh, can so can we use this number to compute, uh, to compare with the security implement implementation of the security? I'm not sure I, I've heard you. It's very noisy in the background, so I suggest we, okay. we talk outside and it will be much easier. Um, no, no. Okay, sorry, I, I will discuss with you after that. It's lunch time, so it's noisy yeah, in the yeah. background. <laughs> Speak, speak loudly, please. Sure. <laughs> so thanks for your talk. Um, I had one question about uh, that uh, reversing hashing functions. Um, I presume if there is two possible inputs for the same output, you would get uh, like uh, both inputs with 50% probability, for instance. But what would happen if there is no inputs at all? Like the, for a given output byte, there is no possible input that would generate it. Uh, interesting. I, it depends if the circuit is reversible or not. It depends. If the circuit is not reversible, um, uh, you will you will use uh, temporary qubits and cilia qubits. So you will have solutions, but uh, with um, impossible uh, temporary uh, variables. Huh? Uh, otherwise, uh, you probably won't have any solution. Uh, that is to say, only noise. But it, it will depend on, on the circuit, and it will depend mostly if you have uh, an optimal circuit, that is to say, absolutely no uh, ancilia qubits during the computation. Thank you. Thank you for attending. I, I will be available outside for other questions. Thank you. <laughs>